Luke chapter 19 this morning in your Bibles. Luke chapter 19, I'll start reading in verse 29 and read through verse 44. Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 44. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, wherein never man, never yet, <laughs> wherein yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? It's amazing how Jesus knew they were going to ask that question, and that there would be someone there to ask that question. And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And as he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Now you need to understand the Pharisees were saying that because they considered this blasphemy. Because they, they just believed Jesus was just a, uh, an illegitimate, um, irritating, ornery rabbi, rabbi, rabbi from Galilee. And, uh, and they, did not, they thought it was blasphemy for people to to actually pretend this was the Messiah riding into Jerusalem. And that's why they said, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And that is because this was a fulfillment of prophecy. It had to be fulfilled. And so if the disciples had kept silent because those words had to be spoken that day, if the disciples and all the people had kept silent, the stones would have cried out that day because it was something that had to be fulfilled. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. We have to really pay attention to times in the Bible when Jesus weeps. Those are very significant moments. And you study those moments when Jesus weeps in the Bible, and you will understand a lot more about yourself, about us, and about that situation when you study the moments when Jesus weeps. And it says, when he was come near... He beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy, of thy visitation. I want to uh, draw your attention to verse 42 and to this one short little phrase where it says, If thou hadst known. If thou hadst known. I'm going to preach to you this morning on the subject, If you only knew. If you only knew, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that I do not have the ability in myself, in my human flesh, to properly apply your word to your people. But Father, I do know that your Holy Spirit dwells inside me, as unworthy as I am, and that your Holy Spirit dwells within your people. And so I know that you can give me the words to say that will clearly communicate the meaning of this passage. And I do know that the Holy Spirit inside each child of God that is gathered in this room today can open up their hearts if they will surrender and be willing to open up their hearts to be able to receive the words that are spoken. So I ask for a miraculous work of your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your spirit. 
that I may faithfully preach your word in Jesus' name. Amen. If you only knew, if you only knew, when I was in Jerusalem about a month ago, I had done something stupid and sprained my ankle. And uh, the first day that I was supposed to spend um, walking around Jerusalem, the old city, and the area surrounding it, the Mount of Olives, the Garden Tomb, the City of David, Valley of Kidron, Valley of Hinnom. I spent that whole morning um, going to the other side of Jerusalem, visiting a, a hospital and a, a, a place called Yad Sarah, which means the hand of Sarah, and uh, getting some crutches because I couldn't walk because my ankle was swollen up really bad. I had sprained it. And uh, so around about the afternoon, I was able to finally get over to the old city and we were able to visit the Western Wall and uh, the Burnt House, which is actually is a, an original house from the time um, uh, that Jesus is referring to here when he's prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem and also was able to visit the Temple Institute, which is uh, the place where you can learn about the plans that the Orthodox Jews have to build a third temple in the place of the Temple Mount where, where the Dome of the Rock is right now. And then the next day was our finally our full day of seeing Jerusalem, and we got up fairly early, and we were able to get a lot more done. And what we did that day is we went and parked the Mamila Mall, Aiden and I, and then we, uh, which is right outside the Jaffa Gate, which goes into the Christian Quarter. We were able to go in there. We went and visited the Church of Holy Sepulchre, and we didn't spend a lot of time there. We walked through all the little, uh, just a little tiny narrow streets, and little tiny shops where they're all trying to sell all their trinkets to the Americans. We went out to the Damascus Gate, which is on the north side, and then went uh, down to the Garden Tomb, and all of this was on crutches. Came back out from the Garden Tomb and then walked around the north side and down to the east side of Jerusalem, which is actually the, the Muslim part, the Arab part. And then we um, went down into the uh, Kiran Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then we walked up. And so as you can imagine, the reason I'm telling you all this is as you can imagine with a swollen ankle, I'm already in a good deal of pain and I'm already getting pretty worn out walking on these crutches as far as we've gone, probably gone two, three miles at that point. And so as I'm going, and it's pretty steep, going up the Mount of Olives. And as we're going up the Mount of Olives, Aiden's a little bit ahead of me and I was going up. And the place that we were going up to is a place that's called in Latin, Dominus Flevit. There's a little Franciscan chapel there and a little garden, some olive trees. And I knew why I wanted to go there. I wanted to go there because the word Dominus Flavit means the Lord wept. And as I was thinking about this verse, and I was hobbling up the Mount of Olives to the place where the Lord wept, um, I, was, I was weeping just thinking about this verse and thinking about the tears of our Lord Jesus because Jesus never wept crocodile tears. He never wept pretend tears. He wasn't a man on a stage acting out a Greek drama or some uh, Shakespearean tragedy. When Jesus wept, he was weeping, weeping, weeping. He was weeping real tears, real tears of sorrow and sadness that his people that there were some things that they didn't know. And because they didn't know those things, that's why they hardened their heart against the Word of God and the Son of God, and they brought all these things upon themselves. And I want you to understand, he wasn't weeping because they didn't know what God said. He was weeping because they didn't know what was going to happen to them if they disobeyed what God said. They knew what God said. And they harden their heart anyway. And so I want you to know that this morning, this message, if you only knew, is not talking about whether or not you know what God says in his word, because most of us know what God says. But it's about why we don't obey what God says. We don't obey because there seems some things we really don't know or don't understand about what will happen if we don't obey. And that is what Jesus is doing. He said, if thou hadst known, if you only knew. Young people, 
If you only knew how God would bless you if you obeyed your parents. If you only knew. See, God tells you to obey your parents, and he promises you that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. But you've got to believe that, and you've got to do it, and then you'll find out by experience that that's true. But you don't actually know how God's going to bless you. But if you only knew, you would. But God doesn't tell you everything that you don't know. He expects you to obey him because he says it, not because you know the future. We don't know the future. But if we only knew, we would do the right thing if we only knew the future. So young people, if you only knew, if you only knew how God would bless you to obey your parents, if you only knew what a blessed life you would have if you would work hard, if you would have good character, if you would tell the truth, if you only knew the blessings that God has for you, if you only knew. Now this is not only to the young people, I'm just starting with the young people. Young people, if you only knew what an amazing blessing God would put into your life if you keep yourself pure. If you only knew. Purity is not a word that's just some law where God's trying to restrict you and what you do in your teen years. Purity is God's plan for you. And God will bless you tremendously in your life if you keep yourself pure until the day you stand at the marriage altar. Young people, if you only knew how God would bless you with a spouse, if you would give up your own desires for what kind of a person you want to marry, and you would say, God, I'll marry the person you want me to marry, if you only knew. If you only knew the blessings God would give you if you decided that you were going to be content in all circumstances, if you only knew. If you only knew that the love of money is the root of all evil, which when some which some having coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, if you only knew how God would bless you, you learn to be content and not love and desire money. God will provide for your needs. Money's not bad. But the love of money is the root of all evil. It will destroy you. If you only knew. Those of you that are married today, if you only knew how many regrets you would avoid if you would be true to your marriage vows, you only knew. If you only knew the power of the testimony of a godly marriage where you are doing your part and following your wedding vows and doing what God commanded you to do, if you only knew. If you only knew what an incredibly blessed life that you would have and the incredible opportunities you would have to reach other people with the gospel if you made your number one goal for your ministry and for your life to raise your children to nurture and have mission of the Lord. If you only knew the way your children would bless you and rise up and call you blessed. If you made your family and your children a priority. If you only knew. If you only knew. If you only knew. Now we're getting to a little bit more to middle age. Which I am now. 40, so I'm getting, getting to that. If you only knew the incredible blessing you would be to your children, your grandchildren, if at your funeral, your family would come, maybe like Cookie, and say, our grandpa fought a good fight. He finished his course, and he kept the faith, if you only knew. Because the devil has his own ways of attacking people who are older and discouraging them and making them want to give up on all their convictions and beliefs and, 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 and not want to impact the next generation, not want to be faithful. We need to finish well. There was a young man named Saul, and he was God's anointed, but he did not finish well. He died, and I stood at that place where he died and slain on Mount Gilboa. He didn't finish well. Apostle Paul finished well. Now he went through, he, he had every reason to give up, didn't he? Because he, the Apostle Paul, was tortured and beaten and stoned. And even all the people that he led to Christ in the city of Ephesus turned against him. That's in, they all decided that Paul was a jerk and why did they ever listen to him? That's at the end of the life he said, his life he said, he said, um, he said, everyone's turned against me now. Talking to Timothy in his last letter, his last letter of 2 Timothy. But you know, the Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. You only knew 
the incredible impact you would have in future generations if you'll be faithful and you'll finish well and not get discouraged. If you only knew. In verse 42, Jesus says this, If thou hadst known, and then he says this, Even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. There are four things in this passage that Jesus says he wished that, is, that, that Jerusalem had known. And he says thee, and thou, and thee, and thou. That's singular. You know? In the King James, it's singular. And that means he's talking to the city. He's not talking just to one person, but he's actually talking to the city, and referring to the city as one entity. There are some things that the city of Jerusalem didn't know. Now, they should have obeyed God anyway. They should have done right anyway, even though they didn't know. But the purpose of this message is to impress on your hearts, and on my heart, that there are so many incredible things that will be a result of doing right, and so many devastating things that will be a result of doing wrong. But God doesn't tell you all that whole story. He just tells you you need to do right, and we got to believe him. We gotta believe God. God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. So he says this in verse 42. If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. And that's the first point is this. If you only knew what belonged to your peace. If you only knew what belonged to your peace. He said the things which belong unto thy peace. You might say, wait a minute, that's kind of a weird word. A, a weird phrase. The things that belong to thy peace. Well, well, I want you to think about it. Um, you have a car probably you brought to, to church, and, and that car belongs to you. So the car is something that belongs to you. When you are at home, you have clothes that you wear, and you have dishes that you eat out of, and you have a roof over your head, and those are things that belong to you. Now, some of them you might be renting, and some of you might be paying off the bank, but either way, a lot of the things you have belong to you. So what are the things that belong to your peace? <clears throat> it's... The things that you do to obey God, those things belong to your peace. So when, if you want a life of peace, and I just think we don't even realize how valuable peace is. Peace it is an amazing, amazingly precious thing. And Jesus is telling Israel, I, Jerusalem, he's saying, there are things, there are things that I have for you that belong to your peace. God wanted peace for them. He wanted good things for them, but they rejected that because they didn't know what things belonged to their peace. In fact, if you read in John chapter, I believe it's 18, the, the Pharisee, the, the, the Jewish leaders actually got together and they said, Jesus is going to take away our peace. I don't know if you know that passage, but they actually got together when they agreed they were going to kill him. They said, he's getting such a big following that the Romans are going to come and destroy our nation because they're going to be afraid of what this Jesus person would do. Now, that was all baloney, because as soon as Jesus came before Pilate, who was the Roman governor, Pilate says, I find no fault in this man. I'll let him go. Pilate knew, the Roman Empire knew, that Jesus was not a threat to them. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my servants would fight. The Romans knew Jesus was not a threat. But the Jews were convinced, or maybe because of their jealousy, they convinced themselves, oh, we got to do this. We got to we gotta kill this man. We got to take care of him, because he's going to, start this big uprising, and then the Romans are going to come and destroy our whole nation. No, you know what actually happened? They rebelled against Jesus Christ and his message of peace. And because of that, they opened up the door for the zealots in Jerusalem, which is what happened at the burnt house. The zealots of Jerusalem actually began to fight against the Romans, and their city was destroyed because they killed Jesus. It was the opposite. And folks, I want you to listen to me. In your life, and in my life, we have our own idea of what will bring us peace but it's not the right one. God knows what will bring us peace. And he tells us in his word, here's how you have peace. And we got to obey that. Because if we only knew the things that belong to our peace, we wouldn't make the choices we're making. Because we think we're going to have peace when we run from God. We think we're going to have peace when we break our marriage vows. We think we're going to have peace when we rebel against authority. But we're not. Those are the things that belong to our peace and we don't even realize it. So Jesus said, if you only knew what belonged to your peace. I want to ask you to turn to Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, verses uh, 15 through 20. Deuteronomy, very, very powerful verse, chapter in the Bible, and verse in the Bible. Deuteronomy is an amazing, fast, amazing book of the Bible where God is, is telling his, is giving instructions to through Moses to his people, telling them how he wants them to live when they enter the promised land. It's Moses' final uh, address to, to God's people. Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. 
And I want you to understand, even though this was directed to the children of Israel, this is God's message to his people, us today as well. Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. See, Jesus said, if you only knew the things that belong to your peace. And Moses is saying this to the children of Israel. He's saying, I set before you this day life and good, death and evil. I'm setting before you. There's things that are going to be, bring you peace and things that are going to destroy you. He says, in, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. And do you see how he's saying? These are the things that belong to your peace. You obey me, I'll give you peace. That's what he's saying. And then he says, but here, but if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. And this is amazing, this statement. I want you to listen carefully. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. He says, I'm setting before you today life and death, blessing and cursing. I want to show Jesus Christ the same thing when he wept over Jerusalem. He says, today, even now in this thy day, the thing that belonged to thy peace. God offers us life and death, blessing and cursing. Now, why don't you understand how we interpret God's word, all of us, because the heart is deceitful of all things. We look at God's word and we see it all with all these different options. And we go, you know, a really good Christian obeys the whole Bible. And they're like super committed. But you know, then there's kind of your mediocre average Christian. Maybe they obey like 75% of about what half the Bible. And you know, they're halfway decent, you know. And then some Christians, you know, they kind of obey maybe 25% of the Bible. And we get this idea that there's, it's like a, 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 I almost said a bacteria. It is a bacteria. Cafeteria, there's a word I'm looking for. <laughs> And we just, we think the Bible is this big cafeteria. And we go, we take a little this and take a little that, take a little this, and we go back and we eat it and we come back. And, and the pastor kind of gives us this cafeteria every Sunday morning or in our Bible. When we read, oh, I'm going to skip that part. I don't really like this kind of a downer passage. And we, go, and we really think that it's all these different options. And, and I want you to know something. There's like some things that taste worse, so I'll avoid that. And I'll eat the desserts because that tastes good. And we think that, and folks, that's not it at all. That's not it at all. God says, I'm showing you life and death, blessing and cursing. That's major. God says, it's not what you think. My way is the way of life. The way of the world is the way of death. By the way, a Christian can choose the way of death. Did you know that? You can be saved, but you can pursue a worldly lifestyle that will end in death, that will destroy you. The Bible is full of examples, Old Testament and New, of God's people who were his covenant people who disobeyed him and ended up experiencing Negative consequences. Bad things happen because of, because of their wrong choices. So he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. By the way, did you know that those people who were rejecting Jesus that day, <coughs> Master rebuked that disciples, do you know their children were destroyed in the destruction of Jerusalem? Did you know there's consequences to your descendants when you say, oh, I can choose what I follow, what I don't follow God, because they don't know the things that belong to their peace. We don't know the things that belong to their peace. We have to believe God that when he says, obey me, because I'm giving you life and death. I'm presenting life and death, blessing and mercy. Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, verse 20. That thou mayest obey his voice. That thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life and the length of thy days. That thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. I want you to know something, young people. I want you to know something, everybody here. God's way is the way of peace. God's way is the way of life. And anytime we think, to whatever, I want you to know something. Okay, you know that analogy? Really good Christians, you know, they try to follow all of it. Some people 75, some 50. I want you to understand that. I want you to understand this based on the Bible. When you say, I'm going to follow 75%, but that 25%, that's for the pastor. You know what you're saying? I want 75% life, 25% death. 
When you say, I'm going to do 50% life and 50% death, well, we say 50% the Bible, 50% what I want, what our culture says is okay. I want you to know something. You're picking 50% life, 50% death. When you say, I'm going to follow 25% life and 70 well, we're not saying that. You're saying 25% what God wants and 75% what I want. I want you to know what you're doing. You're choosing 25% life, 75% death. If you only knew the things that belong to your peace. If you only knew. This is for your own good. And folks, I know you fail. I fail. We all fail. You know, God has a remedy for failure. You know, when you say, I'm going to follow the whole Bible, it doesn't mean you're going to follow it perfectly. But you know what it does mean? You are going to follow the Bible by God's grace, and there's going to be times where you fail. And the Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're not talking about perfection, folks. But we are talking about saying, God, I want the life and peace you have for me. And I am going to, by your grace, follow you faithfully and keep all your commandments all the days of my life. And when I fail, I'll ask forgiveness, and I'll move on. Nobody's going to do it perfectly. Nobody in the Bible did it perfectly except for Jesus Christ. If you only knew it belonged to your peace. And now when we turn back to Luke chapter 19. He said, if you only knew what belonged to your peace. And then he says, still in verse 42, he says, but now are they hid from thine eyes. And that's the second, if you only knew. If you only knew what was hidden from your eyes. If you only knew what was hidden. You'd be like, well, pastor, how can I know what's hidden? If it's hidden, I can't know it. Yes. That's why you got to trust God. That's why you got to obey Him. Because you have to believe there are things, some things that are hidden from you. Parents, simple question. Are there some things that are hidden from your children? Yeah. There's a lot of things your children don't know. But if they trust you and obey you, you know what? Someday they'll learn a lot of things that they couldn't understand when they were young. They just had to obey you because you said it. It was hidden. They weren't able to handle it. Did you know that there's a lot of things God's not going to tell you about your future? I'm glad God doesn't tell me my future. I would probably have a heart attack right here and die if God showed me a vision of the rest of my life. I'm glad. I, I wouldn't want to know. Now, here's the thing. I trust him. I know he's going to lead me and guide me. It's all going to be okay. But can you imagine if God showed Job a little preview of his future when things were going good for him? I think he probably would have had a heart attack and died. God, we can't handle that. We can't handle knowing the future. You know, your children can't handle knowing the future. I mean, they're struggling with 2 plus 2 equals 4. You better not show an algebraic equation. They might have a heart attack. Don't show it to them. <laughs> All right? So here's what I'm trying to say. There are things that are hidden from us. And he said, but now are they hid from thine eyes. Listen, if you only knew what was hidden from you, and what does that mean? That means this. you got to trust God. And you got to do right. you got to obey him. Because there are some things that are hidden from you you can't understand now, but someday you'll understand them. And you'll look back and say, God, I am so glad that I did what was right. I want to tell you something. When I was... A teenager um, there were some things that I did because the Bible said it and I didn't really understand how God had blessed me later I just did it because the Bible said it and I praise the Lord that God showed me just do it because I say it because now I look back and I go man how could I how I could have wrecked my life if I had said I don't really see any problem with this I don't know why it's gonna be a problem later on I'm so glad I did what God said and that's what God wants us to know. There's some things that are hidden from us. So I want to ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. I'm sorry, not 1 Corinthians. I typed that wrong. Yes, it is 1 Corinthians. If you only knew how confused I would get when I was preaching. <laughs> okay. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. And I'm going to show you something about this passage, that this passage has a very well-known verse in it, but the verse is actually taken out of context. It doesn't mean what we think it means. It's okay. It's still true when you take it out of context, but it's just not true that it's, that's what it meant, that passage. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. This is a verse you've heard quoted many times, but I'm going to read to you in context. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, talking about mature Christians, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even, listen to this word, the hidden wisdom. Remember what he said, now are they hid from thine eyes? The hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. Listen to this. These are the people who are about to kill Jesus when he's weeping at, on Mount of Olives. Listen. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, if you only knew they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew, they wouldn't have crucified him. Now, here's the thing. 
They couldn't know it. Instead, they needed to just obey God. They needed to just look at the Old Testament prophecies and say, even though this guy is really annoying to us and we're jealous of his ministry and he can do all these miracles we can't do, because he fits Old Testament prophecy, we're going to put our trust in him anyway. Which, by the way, some of them did. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He put his trust in Jesus. They had a choice, but many of them chose not to believe in him. If they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then listen, how many times you heard this verse quoted? Verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Pause. That sounds like heaven, doesn't it? I have not seen, neither have ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We said it because we haven't seen. We say, we say, I haven't seen, ear hasn't heard. There's all these things in heaven God prepared for us, and we haven't seen them. It sounds like it's talking about heaven. Read the very next verse. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Wait, did he say God will reveal them unto us when we get to heaven? What does it say? God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. I want you to understand that that verse, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that not love him, is not talking about heaven. Now it's true that there's a lot of things in heaven we don't see, but don't you know something? John, his eye actually saw heaven, and he actually described it to us. But there are probably details about heaven that we don't know, but yet actually, John's eye actually saw it. And he actually described it to us, and our ear has heard about it whenever we read Revelation 22 and 21. We actually know a lot about that. But he says this, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. God hath revealed them. He's saying God has already revealed it to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us of God. By the way, remember the message last week about put off the old man? Did you know the old man is the natural man? It's the same thing. Did you know when the Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of God? It's not talking about unsaved people. It's talking about your flesh. Your old man, which you still have with you till the day you die, it never understands the things of God. So when you listen to the flesh, you won't understand the things of God. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. When you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you, you will understand the things of God. Now, it's also true about unsaved people that they can't understand it because all they have is the natural man. That's true. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. Wait, did I say I was going to stop in verse... 16. The things also which also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but the whole which the Holy Ghost teacheth, complaining, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Pray for your pastor, we can't talk today. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I want you to understand something. When I start thinking according to the old man, I start going, I am never going to have any fun if I obey my parents. You're a teenager. I'm going to have a horrible life if I stay faithful to the person that I married. That's the wisdom of man. That is the thoughts of your flesh and what the world thinks. And those are things that are hidden from you. The things God is going to do in your life are hidden from you when you're just focused on your own happiness and what the world says. But he says this, Jesus said, now are they hid from thine eyes. Why? Because they were just focusing on their own flesh and the, the wisdom of the world. But in which the Holy Ghost teaches. Listen, you and I as Christians, we got to focus on what the Holy Spirit is teaching us. We have to believe that. And you know what's going to happen? When we listen to the Holy Spirit, what's going to happen is as we obey God, God is going to reveal to us by His Spirit all these things that our eyes haven't seen and our ears haven't heard. In your life, as a Christian, the longer you serve God, the longer you obey Him and do uh, surrender to the Holy Spirit, say yes to God and do what His Word says, the more you are going to experience things in your life that eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard. And it will change your life. But those are things that are hidden from the natural man. But the natural man receiveth not the things of God, things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man is your old man. But he that is spiritual, or spirit-filled, walking by the Spirit, spirit-led, judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Have you ever heard that verse quoted before? Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And the obvious answer is no one, right? But then it says this, but we have the mind of Christ. Amazing. It says, 
Nobody knows the mind of the Lord. Nobody can instruct him that says, but we have the mind of Christ. You know what that's saying? Because the Holy Spirit dwells inside you. Do you know when you surrender and walk by the Spirit and obey God, even though there's a lot of things you don't know, did you know your eyes going to see things that no one else sees and your ears going to hear things that you've never heard and seen before? God's going to do amazing things in your life, but if you only knew it was hidden from your eyes. Right now it's hidden from your eyes, so you've got to trust God and obey Him. But if you only knew what was hidden from your eyes. There are so many things God has for you that your eye hasn't seen and your ear hasn't heard, and that's why you won't believe it. Your pastor will tell you, obey God, and it'll work out. Do what's right. And he'll tell you what the Bible says, and you'll sit there and you'll go, yeah, well, I don't really know if that'll really, well, that maybe happened to him because he's special, but I don't really not know if that will happen to me. No, it's because it's hidden from you. If you only knew it was hidden from your eyes. If you only knew. Uh, back to Luke 19. If you only knew what belonged to your peace, God has peace for you, but you got to obey him. If you only knew what was hidden from your eyes, God has some amazing things for you in your future, young people and everyone else here. But you got to be faithful and obey God, walk by the Spirit, and then those things will be revealed to you. You will see the blessings that God has for you, the good things God has for you. So if you only knew what belonged to your peace, if you only knew what was hidden from your eyes, but then in uh, number three, if you only knew, and this is so important, this is the negative part, the consequences of your choices. If you only knew the consequences of your choices. And that's verse 43 through 44. Think about this. The reason that they were planning to kill Jesus, again, I didn't go to that passage, I didn't even have it in my notes, but uh, you, if you want to study that out more, I believe it's John chapter 18, you want to study it out more, you can ask me afterwards, go home and study John chapter 18. But they literally said to themselves, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed unless we kill Jesus. That's what they said. But you know the opposite happened? Jerusalem was destroyed because they killed Jesus. It was the exact opposite of what they thought. If you only knew the consequences of your choices... Here's what he said. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. That is the consequences of their choice. Now let's bring it practically to us. If you only knew the consequences of your choices. Young people, if you only knew how much you would regret disobeying your parents. Especially when your kids start disobeying you. That's when you really start to regret it. <laughs> if you only knew how much you would regret losing your purity. If you only knew how much you would regret choosing who you want to marry and not listening to your pastor, to your parents, or anyone else to give you any kind of a general advice or counsel. I'm not talking about arranged marriage. You know I've preached on this before. But actually getting advice from godly, mature, older Christians who could tell you what would be a good person to marry not to marry. Folks, it is such a deadly cancer in our society today that young people who have no wisdom go out and pick their own person they're going to marry and they don't want to listen to anybody's advice. Hey, that guy, he's had three, four jobs. You really think that he's going to support you? Hey, that person, he was he's had four or five different girlfriends and he was cheating on You think he's going to be faithful to you as a husband? Hey, whoa, listen, that person doesn't read the Bible. He doesn't go to church. No, don't marry him. No, I'm going to marry him. I know better than you. Who, who to marry? That's what we do, folks, and we're destroying us. And young people, if you only knew the consequences of your choices, you wouldn't be making wrong, you wouldn't make wrong choices. If you only knew. But God's not going to tell you. You know what he's going to tell you? He's going to tell you, I promise you, you will obey my word, you follow me, you'll be blessed. You've got to believe that, you've got to do it. And, uh, but he's not going to tell you, you won't know all the consequences. If you only knew the consequences of your choices, if you only knew. There are many consequences. The same with us, folks. I have seen such devastating effects of moving more toward middle-aged people. I have seen such devastating effects in people's lives when people aren't faithful to their wedding vows. You know, people give up on things. Or when people decide they're just going to hop from church to church and never. And again, I, <laughs> I understand that sometimes God leads you from one church to another. And I, I don't want any of you to feel like I'm telling you what church to go to. I'm not. All right? But I'll tell you this. There are people who just can't ever get along with any any church, and so they go go to one church for a little bit, and they want another one, want another one, and they can never change. And if they only knew that the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, together, usually what they end up doing is just going off by themselves and not going to church anymore at some point. And if they only knew how they were destroying their own lives and their own marriages and their own children by not being committed to the body of Christ, the Bible says the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Again, I'm not telling you to go to a liberal church. I'm not going to tell you to go to a church where, where there's some damaging unbiblical doctrines being taught or where people are mean to you and don't love you and accept you. I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. The Bible does command us not forsaking some of ourselves together. 
And the Bible says we should do it so much the more as we see the day approaching. And if we knew the consequences of our choices, we wouldn't be making those wrong choices. But you know what? We don't know that. And so what we have to do is just be faithful to his word and do it because God says so. And then we will see the benefits later. You only knew the consequences of your choices. And even sometimes older people who get discouraged because they haven't seen a lot of the things they wanted to see in life and get negative. And sometimes they quit going to church. Sometimes they just go and just become negative or always attacking everyone. And sometimes they even abandon the faith in their old age and stop being faithful. And that is such a devastating effect on the younger generation because they say, if grandma and grandpa have given up, what hope is there for me? You only knew the consequence of your choices. You would do what God says every time. You only knew what belonged to your peace. God has, God has peace planned for you. I will extend, extend peace to her like a river. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. If you only knew what was hidden from your eyes, or some things you can't see, but God will reveal them to you by your Spirit as you walk by the Spirit. If you only knew the consequences of your choices, the day shall come upon thee, and an enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side. If you only knew the consequences, you would do right. And last is this, if you only knew that God was speaking to you. I feel this is the most important. If you only knew that God is speaking to you. And that's found at the end of verse 44. It says, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Because thou knewest. He says, why did all this stuff happen? When Jesus summarizes his entire statement about Jerusalem, as he stands on the Mount of Olives looking over Jerusalem, everybody's saying, Hosanna! Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is Palm Sunday. And they're all excited. And they're putting their, they're waving the palm branches and they're putting down the their their garments and, and he's and he's riding down the hill on the donkey. And you can picture the whole thing. And all of a sudden somebody says, Wait, wait, what's going on? Stop. He's crying. Why is Jesus Christ, the prophet of Nazareth, crying? We're praising him. Why is he crying? Well, because Jesus is crying because he's looking out over Jerusalem and he knows what they're about to do in a few days. And he knows what's going on and he's saying, if you only knew, if you only did what was right, if you only obey God. And he says this, but the real reason that it all happened is this, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. That was why. And you know what? What was the visitation? It was Jesus was the word made flesh. Jesus came and he preached God's word to God's people and God's people rejected God's word. That's what happened. He said, now it was not the time by visitation. And you know what? I feel that all of us here are guilty of that. We are guilty of not knowing that God is speaking to us. Isn't that true? We all have our moments. We all have our times where God is speaking and we don't really recognize that God is speaking. For example... It's the easiest thing in the world when a, fre a fleshly, frail human being stands behind a pulpit and says, open your Bibles, to really think that's just a man talking. It is. I admit I'm just a man. But you know what? There are a lot of times where if the man is being faithful to the Word of God, even if he's not saying it all perfectly, explaining it the way you want or whatever, that God is still speaking. i got to tell you, I can't tell you how often God speaks to me through messages. I've been listening to some messages this week by Jack Hiles, and every single message is like God's going, see, this is what you need to learn, see? And it just amazes me. I'm just shocked, you know, and uh, I've been talking to my wife about it, and then I just, I listen to the next one, I go, wow. I listen to the next one, I go, wow. And I can just see God is just talking to me. He's telling me all these things, and yet, it doesn't matter who you name as some famous preacher or someone you like listening to. They're human beings. They're human beings. They're not doing everything right. They're not saying it. They're not infallible. They're not popes. They're just human beings. By the way, Pope is a human being as well. But I mean, some people think he's infallible, that's why I have to clarify. But anyway, it's God is often speaking through a human being. But you don't know he's speaking. If you only knew that God was speaking to you, then you listen. And folks, do you want to know how you know if God's speaking? It's really not that complicated. It's if it lines up with this book. That's how you know. So folks... The pastor doesn't have to say it all perfectly and in the most eloquent way. No, the question is, what is he saying lines up with this book? What is he saying that doesn't line up with this book? That's the question. And folks, it's not just, I don't want to make it just about a pastor. How about in your daily devotions? Are you reading the Bible? Or your pastor sends you a Bible text? <laughs> or you're on Facebook scrolling down and, and people have Bible verses posted on Facebook. Folks, do you understand that when you're reading the Bible, you're reading the very words of God? 
God is speaking to you. Don't look at it as just words on a page, just thoughts, ideas. No, folks, it's God speaking to you. It's God because it's God's word. And you know what? A lot of times we miss out on incredible blessings and we miss out on what God will teach us because we don't know that God's speaking. We either think it's a man speaking or we just go, it's the Bible. No, folks, it's not the Bible. It's God. It's the word of God. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. If you only knew that God is speaking to you. Folks, God is speaking. When the word is open, when you read the word and you hear someone else quote the word and the pastor preaches the word, folks, God is speaking. And it's not the words that I'm saying, but it's whether or not what I'm saying lines up with the word of God. God is speaking. That's true when I'm in the pew and Mr. Hansen is teaching. Whatever he's saying, it lines up with the word. That's God speaking. It's true when I'm at the Baptist for Life where I was listening to John Wilkerson preach. It's true. It's true when I'm driving the car and I turn on the radio and I hear a radio preacher. When what he's saying lines up with the word, God speaking. And he said, thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. I want you to know something. God's speaking to you. God has a whole book full of truth for you. And he's speaking. But because you just kind of go, well, you know, it's the Bible. It's a long book. I don't really understand it all. I don't know. I'm kind of bored with it. I just move on. And you know what happened? You're being, and I'm being when I do this, just like the children, the, the, the people in Jerusalem. And God speaking. And you're just kind of ignoring it. Folks, oh, God speaking. When the word of God is preached, when you read it, when you hear it, God speaking. If you only knew that God is speaking to you. 1 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Many of you could say it by heart. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture, folks. Not just the parts that you like. Not just the verses you have framed on your wall. Nothing wrong with that. I got verses framed on my wall. Not just the things that you enjoy. But, folks, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, unto all good works. All scripture. All scripture. When the Bible's open, when the Bible's preached, when the Bible's quoted, God is speaking to you. If you only knew that God is speaking to you. You know what? I really believe this at Dell's Baptist Church. On Thursday night, if we opened up the book of Leviticus, and we said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, God is speaking to us. I don't really believe that would change our life. If we got up on Monday morning and we read the Bible, or maybe if you have a different schedule and you work at nights or something, you got to sleep in, and so maybe you do it on Monday night, whatever time, you, is your Bible reading time, when you opened up the Word of God, you said, God's speaking to me. It would change your life. It would change my life. If every time I heard someone quote the Bible, every time I listened to someone else preach, every time I studied to preach to you, I said, God's speaking. That would make a difference. We would take it seriously. If you only knew. We need, folks, to really believe that what God says is true, and if we obey it, he'll bless us. We need to really believe that the things that are in this book belong to our peace. We really need to believe that the things that are in this book are for our own benefit. We need to believe there will be consequences to our choices. We need to believe that God is speaking to us. If we'll do that, folks, God will bless us. We'll bring revival. People will be saved. And all eternity we will have to rejoice laying our crowns at the feet of Jesus Christ, praising him, just like they did on Palm Sunday, but we get to do it throughout eternity, praising him, because we listened to what God said, did what he said, and we saw all the people that were saved and all the lives that were changed, because we really believe God is speaking to them. You only knew the things that belong to peace. You only knew. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this reminder. Heavenly Father, I fear that we could easily look down on the people in Jerusalem and miss the point of this message and not realize that God is speaking to us through his word and that we very often pick and choose what we're going to obey we're not going to obey in the Bible. And God, I know we're all fallible human beings and our pastors are not exempt from this problem. But Father, I pray that everybody here today, everybody at Dells Baptist Church, I pray, Father, that we would all take seriously your word and want to do it and say, you know, there's a lot of things that we don't know, but we're going to obey God anyway. And we're going to reap the blessings and the benefits of obeying God. Father, help us to obey God because he says it, even though there's a lot of things that we don't know. In Jesus' name, amen.